we still have a few people logging in, so we're going to give you a few uh, seconds to get settled and then we'll get underway. few more seconds. Okay, people are joining in. Okay. I think we're ready to go. Hello everybody, my name is Joe. Welcome to the fourth installment of our in-session series. Today's subject is design curricula for climate crisis and uh, we have over 450 guests from uh, 47 countries joining us today. Thank you for joining everybody. Today, uh, before introducing you to our esteemed speakers Delphina and Harriet, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. First, um, today's webinar is being recorded. We will uh, share the recording on our event page at some point next week. Uh, please uh, feel free to use the chat button if you have any technical difficulties uh, regarding the webinar. We invite you to ask questions by using the Q&A function. You can upvote the questions um, that you find interesting if you like. And any remaining unanswered questions at the end of the session, uh, we will try to get our speakers to reply and make the answers available on our event page. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Delphina and Harriet. I'm going to hand you over to Delphina, who is going to start today's conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Joe, for the introduction. Hello and welcome for the fourth in-session talk. First, I'm going to introduce myself uh, because most of you, I'm sure you don't know me. Um, I am Delfina Fantini van Dietmar. I have a background in biology. In 2016, I obtained my PhD, which was a practice-based design thesis entitled The Idiot. My thesis was based on um, Dostoevsky character Prince Mishkin uh, from his book The Idiot. Uh, and I used that figure to critically analyze uh, AI epistemology in relation to intelligence. And for all of you who have read it, I'm sure you can recall Prince Mishkin incessantly asking, but why? Uh, specifically, I was interested in how his constant questioning act as an instrument for revealing the corruption of the society, the inadequacy of the value system, and also the stultifying nature of its institutions. Um, so that's where I come from. I am very interested in this idiotic questioning of the society that apparently works so well. And I think today this talk will be uh, a lot about this in regards to climate change and also about inequality and discrimination. Currently, I'm teaching at the RCA. I'm a lecturer and a researcher in the design products department. And also I'm a visiting lecturer in the MRES design and at information experience design. Today, we're here to start the conversation about climate crisis and design education in the context of post-COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter. As most of you are aware, the pandemic we just experienced in great part is the result of our destructive relationship with ecosystems and also the extermination of wildlife habitat. The neoliberal global economy, which is the basis of most of contemporary society, is founded on the belief of a sustained economic growth. The market growing financial expectations has resulted in a natural habitat degradation at the expenses of vital nature resources. By degrading the habitats of multiple species, we break down the protective barriers that biodiversity provides us. As a consequence, we're getting way closer to wild species, generating the perfect conditions for zoonosis. So for all of you who don't know much about this term, zoonosis means the process when the animal pathogens pass to human. So as this pandemic clearly showed us, we devastated the wild death, we approached to them, and what we're experiencing now is the result of our unecological behavior that we've been having for several um, decades. So what we just experienced is the perfect illustration of our unecological behavior which is based on overconsumption, pollution, urbanization, which are affecting now directly. During the confinement, we have experienced a window of times where we stop a big part of our consumption habits, demonstrating how we actually don't need that much and how it's possible to live differently. 
This has also led to some promising outcomes. We have been contemplating a world with significantly fewer toxic emissions, terrestrial and aerial traffic, thanks to policies that were quickly and successfully implemented in several parts of the world. In the UK, the green economy has boomed and in many parts of the world, there's an anti-consumerism thriving, encouraging a less wasteful living. A few weeks ago, we experienced the emergence of Black Lives Matters movement, stressing the relevance of a socially and cultural diversity, reminding us not only that Black life matters, but that every life matters. There are several minorities and not minorities that we need to take care of. It is imperative that we act upon beyond this fleeting Black profile on Instagram. And as a designer, I think we have a huge responsibility on this. This movement of environmental and social revolts has forced us to urgently question the underlying economic system, triggering an ethical reordering. This environmental and social awakening shows that, that issues can keep ignored, opening a design, a political opportunity, hopefully triggering a social environmental paradigm shift. In this breaking point, an urgent question to ask ourselves is, how can design respond to climate crisis? And which are the potential strategies to decolonize the design discipline? The unregulated state of the art has provoked an environmental and social threat requiring that designers and design practitioners and academics reconsider the practice and rethink future values. This acute crisis should help us to reorientate and refocus a post-anthropocene discipline of design. As my colleague Alon described the other day when we were discussing our next academic year, design needs to climb back from the tree it has climbed up. And I think it was very graphical and it really represents the point uh, where we are now. We need to confront and tackle these large scale climate and social challenges. And for this, we need radical changes. We are in a moment in history where there is an avoidable and pressing need to work collectively to find a meaningful ecological path, considering who suffer from the effects of production socially and also culturally. It is critical to start thinking of the deficiency of the design curriculum and it is time to propose and envision design designers' uh, alternatives. It is my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Harriet Harris. Harriet is a qualified architect whose research and practice is largely focused upon pioneering new pedagogic models and design education. After her season at the RCA, where she was the head of postgraduate research program in architecture and interior design, Harriet is currently the Dean of Pratt School of Architecture in Brooklyn, New York. She has won several awards, including Brooks Teaching Fellowship, a Churchill Fellowship, two Santander Fellowships, two Dayawa Awards, Clore Fellowship for Cultural Leadership and an ESTA Pioneer Award, just to mention a few. Her public consultancy roles include writing national construction curriculum for the UK government's Department for Education and international program validations. Harriet has a prolific academic publishing career. Among her books, she has published Radical Ped Pedagogies, Architectural Education and the British Tradition and also Agenda Professions. I welcome Harriet, who will start this in session today with a very much needed provocation for the discipline of design. Thank you very much, Delphina, and welcome everyone to, um, I guess, education COVID style. Um, it's all very different for all of us, but it's great to welcome such an international community of, of hopefully not just listeners, but contributors later in the Q&A session. So um, for this hour that we have together, um, I wanted to start with a set of provocations, I suppose. Um, for many of you, these might be affirmations rather than provocations, but just something to give us a framework um, in our discussion following um, the first 10 minutes. So I'm going to start share screen and then present with you. Okay. And Delphina, if there's any issues, you'll let me know. Okay. So. Why have I called it crisis and not um, change? Well, I mean, I'm taking my cue here from the Extinction Rebellion. Um, they choose this terminology because what they want to emphasize is this is the situation is now acute. There is no kind of future. When we talk about change, it implies some gradual shift. And in fact, everything that the data highlights is that what we'll see are sudden radical changes in environmental conditions, um, um, you know, instantaneous extinction of certain species, um, sudden um, rises in temperature and sea level. So I don't really you know, there's nothing really that you, one could um, associate that kind of change with something much more incremental. This is going to be 
um, much more immediate for all of us. So we need to start looking at it in a much more serious way. And I think that, to be honest, the linguistics um, around the environmental situation we're facing are very complacent. We need a kind of language that really not only defines the nature of the problem in a, a much more direct way, but starts to entertain what it is to, to live in what is potentially a post-anthropocene. We're still very unhuman centered in the way that we try to understand the problem. We can't even begin to get to come to terms with what it is to be grieving the loss of so many plants and species already deeply affected, if not um, killed. So on that um, rather depressing note, um, I will continue with some other thoughts. So that I wanted to start with just sort of thinking about what is an existential crisis. So we think about existential crises as obviously a planetary problem, but I think it's also potentially a disciplinary one or an industrial one. Um, and, and in a way, if you look at what architects and designers, um, depend independent of which sub-discipline, if you like, they're part of, whether it's fashion or product design, we're all facing, I would say, a relevance crisis. Where are we in relation to finding solutions for the problem? So I think there's a kind of immediate assumption, actually, that designers will just be there till the bitter end, you know, doing stuff, in some cases, churning out useless products, in other cases, maybe doing some stuff that's progressive and actually part of the solution. But we should not necessarily assume that all of us will be there if the jobs that we'll be doing within the next 20 or even 15 years haven't been invented yet, then there's no, should be no clear assumption that without asserting our relevance and being impactful that we will necessarily make it into the surviving 15%. The other thing that we know is so much of what we do as designers is being in, in a way lost to automation. So these kind of non-human beings, which have an important role to play and in many ways act as a proxy for us. I mean, you think about the, the Facebook data center in California, there's 1.9 billion lives in there. And in fact, a piece of all of our lives, every single person in this, who's in the audience right now who has a Facebook profile has some real estate in Facebook's data center. So when we start thinking of automation as this other, there's a real complacency around understanding the more I would say the more intimate dimensions of the association and what we could really do with that. But I also look to what um, I was, my experiences were as an architect when I was principally doing a lot of um, tricky work, you know, a lot of mundane work, um, uh, designing, you know, sections, worrying about scheduling and specifications. And, I, you know, in many ways, automation could be a force for liberation and give us in, in a way more equipment to confront the problem. But it's interesting that, again, this is putting, I think, a lot of designers and a lot of architects, we're seeing declining and roles within the construction industry overall because of automation it starts to not necessarily we shouldn't be threatened by our own disciplinary or professional extinction but start asking questions about what else we could be doing besides the more mundane tasks that machines do so much better anyway and of course you know i'm starting with architecture and don't worry i'll get to all the other designers um you know we have a bad reputation we're not necessarily seen as the good guys let's not get started on the public perception of our ability to act as agents equally for all members of society we know that when it comes to environmental materiality, that we are abusers, we are you know, inappropriately um, and insufficiently um, using hardly any recycled or upcycled materials and predominantly relying on vast shipping networks, um, typically from the global north to the south, to get materials to um, design many of our buildings and spaces. I mean, in fact, if you even look at the Empire State in New York, that's principally from made out of Portland stone from England. So it's more British than it is American. And yet it's this really, really profound American icon. Um, what we also know that within um, the design industry that the more we specify the more we design the more that we build um, the more that we make whether it's um, an iphone or a dress or a pair of shoes or uh, even digital technologies there are, is a vast workforce of either children or indentured labor or just directly um, you know um, slaves who are working in making our stuff so there's an enormous kind of human calculation when we talk about you know our kind of um, vegan egg latte that was made using you know rainforest tears there's a kind of I think a disconnect between understanding the production supply chains and the implications for many many workers who are just not factored in to the ethical and ecological dimensions of, of those resources what we also know is that every year we will produce 30,000 new products um, but interestingly 85% of them will fail um, and that's within the first year and 95% overall. So we're on this kind of constant cycle of producing and producing and producing. And that's the end game, right? It's like, it becomes a creative Tourette's, you know, I'm a designer, I design, I'm an architect, I design buildings. It's that kind of relentlessness, that kind of never really understanding the potential of design to move beyond the obsession and with the artifact, this object driven production. Um, and, it, and, and not understanding that actually what else could that design thinking do? How could it move into a more ephemeral, more abstract space that is actually much more around policy or strategy, um, but is far more impactful than any one fetishized object. 
And of course, in fashion, what we do know is that 60% of um, fabric fibres are fossil fuel derived. So let's not even get started on, again, supply chain slavery in relation to fashion industry. And then most of that goes into landfill and typically not landfill in the Northern Hemisphere. So again, you see this um, inequitable push and pull between the raw materials suppliers of the Southern Hemisphere and the global North with its relentless demand for this stuff um, that once used on potentially worn only a few times, um, just sends it right on back to, for it to become essentially toxic waste under the earth. Um, back to construction again, what we also know that within the next five years we're looking, and this is from now till then, so we are in a crisis and, and even now um, we are still doubling on our construction waste. I mean it's very interesting to know that the majority of the world's species have been annihilated since environmentalism was discovered in the 1960s and 70s. So it doesn't seem like awareness is enough, right? It's not working evidently. And of course, for those of you that say, oh, I'm an app designer, I'm fine. I don't, you know, yeah, okay, there's, there's some products attached, but it's what I do is quite ephemeral. What we need to understand is internet produces more than 830 million tons of CO2 every year. So every tweet, every, um, you know, WhatsApp, every TikTok is still a big part of the problem in relation to waste. Um, and that's far more actually our social media, you know, um, if you like uh, fetishization and obsessions, as well as all the other forms of digital technologies that we use in internet technologies, have their own CO2 imprint. They're not neutral technologies by any stretch of the imagination. And of course, e-waste, which is electronic waste, which is the, if you like, the platforms upon which these um, internet technologies are situated, typically get sent off to poor countries to be burned or dumped. And again, really putting the toxicity burden onto those countries and communities and as i know you've got scholars at Pratt, um, scholars at the rca who are doing great work on this in relation to lithium batteries um, in the school of architecture if you didn't know you should definitely check out their work so um what we also know is that you know our kind of interest in animals is is a very intriguing one you know there's like we have obviously a bigger debate about veganism going on and and i think that's a super important conversation we may come back to later um but it, again it's this kind of disconnect between um, what humans, their consciousness about the imp impact of what they do and yet the fact that there's no joined up thinking between again our demands on materials, you know, things not being recycled, our specifications as architects or designers, this is what is driving the destruction of the rainforest, it's what's driving the destruction of natural habitat and it's what's directly driving the extinction of species. So it's not just like a bunch of angry people in the Amazon burning trees down to get access to oil, they're also logging and they're, and they're generating materials from vast mines within these regions that are actually a big part of everyday products that you can go right now and buy in an apple store so i think um what we also have is an issue around um you know understanding that how precarious our position is right now so we've had obviously um five mass extinctions before and it didn't really take much typically a temperature shift of about 17 degrees we've already heated up the planet enough to be five degrees away from a mass extinction and you know of the of the um other five this um extinctions we've had um, typically between 75% and 94% of, of all life on the earth was wiped out. So again, there shouldn't be an assumption that it's just going to be a bunch of righteous vegan designers left at the end of this, um, trying to save the planet. The position we're in may mean that it's only the billionaires and their spaceships, and, and frankly, most of them are perpetrators. So we need to start getting our act together and, and operating, if you like, creating some sort of confrontation and resistance against that possibility. And of course, designers more generally are understood to be you know, um, all very eco up until a certain point. Um, you know, I'm sure there's recycled floor tiles in Trump's bathroom and in some of his, um, in Hotel Marlego, but I'm thinking, you know, the, the many arguments that we're hearing right now is that design is more generally seen as complicit in the problem. It creates surplus need. It, if you like, um, it's entirely contingent on, if you like, the, um, the endless desire to consume more, produce more, desire more, that is modern capitalism. And we have been unable, um, not just in our industry, but also in, um, very much, I think, our um, pedagogy by implication of stepping back from the idea that we, it is about this production, that this, again, fetishization of the object and the, and the outputs and how student work is measured and how student work is assessed and obviously how industry measures success as designers is entirely about that. So um, really, when we talk about the idea of a curriculum for climate change, there's a few questions really about, and, and again, this is like a play on the idea of change. Um, you know, is it really going to be about um, a, a kind of a recognition and a confrontation of thinking, right, it's all the billionaires and it's all the Trumps and it's all of the other people around the world who are the problem, when in fact, frankly, at the moment, we're positioned very much as part of the problem through the, the way that we operate. So schools of design and art are very much um, um, complicit in everything's got not going on. It's not an ex external and existential threat in that respect. So in a way, the provocation is really then to think about what the solutions are and what the possibility for a design um, 
a curriculum is that could in many ways be some sort of response to the climate um, crisis and I think my contention is that it's really principally around the decolonization of the curriculum and I want to explain my thinking in relation to this so for those of you that don't know what decolonization means it's very much a case of understanding um, really that what we need to do is look very keenly at all of our canons, all of our knowledge frameworks, all of our epistemologies and our processes and, and our value systems within every discipline, not just in, in isolation, but how they interrelate and understanding that it comes down to who is creating this stuff, wh what is it for, um, whose power systems um, are rewarded through these kinds of production and, and again, whose knowledge and, and, does, and does all this work really, really serve. And I think this really comes down to what we understand to be intersectionality theory, if you have a look to the work of Kimberly Crenshaw, it's understanding that these things are all, you know, it's not just one thing in isolation, that these things are very, very deeply interconnected. Um, and, and what I mean by this is, is really thinking about notions of, um, you know, it's not that racism is separate from the climate crisis, it's at the heart of the climate crisis, because we know, for example, that it's people of colour who are more actively um, discriminated against through um, the rising temperatures, it's their um, communities, um, their regions that are at the moment more directly threatened by overheating or by flooding or by toxicity and pollution. And again, when you look at the work of, for example, Carol Adams, it's understanding that gender relations and inequalities, again, they're the hallmark of, of, of really this issue around the climate crisis. Women are disproportionately affected um, by global warming because they're more often to be doing certain types of labour that expose them to greater risk of toxicity and pollution. They're more likely to be, um, you know, made vulnerable by the fact that they have, they're the principal carers for children. Um, speciesism, again, this idea, this is it, which is where veganism really comes into this, um, but it's understanding the fact that, you know, all the time we, we are principally designing, most of us, or we're preconditioned to design exclusively for human in existence and again we foreground the rights and the needs of humans over other species is never really an approach where anyone just you know there isn't really an architecture for non-architects it's um, non-humans it's all very much around designing all the time for people and obsessing about participatory design to be just about participation among the same species and not into species relations and this the point is that you know there can't be a climate crisis curriculum that deals with one species in isolation that's not going to work it has to be a multi-species solution that's entirely overlooked by the pedagogy and the curriculum that we have within our schools similarly homophobia same with disabledism and same with regionalism in summary because i want us to get to the conversation and then i think one of the, the enormous conceits we have about what design is is that it is always really um, focused on the idea of some form of production there has to be an output and through that becomes the metric that is the principal metric that defines us and validates us as designers regardless of discipline or context or field and i think one of my arguments is that actually what we haven't really got ahead around is de designing in action so at the moment it's like we design you know we, we get we go through our kind of product obsessions and then some people start thinking about design thinking and moving into design strategy and design policy but there's also a kind of a whole conversation that needs to happen around this idea of inaction. Like, what, how do we design to stop what we're doing rather than design to make things? How do we design the kind of, the, what is the design of non-making, non-production, um, and, and really understanding what that could mean for design, teaching and curriculum. And so that really is my provocation for us to think about these things and to do it in a very immediate way, because I don't know how long we have. Um, you know, I was thinking earlier, just as I, a bird flew into my apartment earlier and it got trapped inside and I have three other animals who probably would try to eat the bird. And the first thought that struck me is why on earth have you come inside because I can't save you, I can't protect you. This is a dangerous space. And it's a funny thing, isn't it, that we have this enormous, wonderful thing known as the planet, which is, you know, and people talk about in romantic ways about it being this ultimate design project. And I see it as this enormous, terrifying, unwieldy liability where we've already done so much to completely destroy it. But it is this sense that actually there is nothing right now that we are doing that is in any way an effective confrontation of, of actually an ongoing demise. Nothing has really changed. We are, a few, we are a few steps closer to being hotter today than we were yesterday. By the end of the week, there'll be other you know, species dead. Hundreds die every day. Um, and it's, I see no ability for us to stop this progression. So somewhere in a conversation about what um, designing any kind of future is in relation to climate crisis curriculum is really a conversation around designing grief. You know, we are moving into an existence now where we are, need to come to terms with what we've done 
And I think it's if we keep suspending belief about the extent of the damage by talking about change and, you know, and our concerns about the environment, it's that deferral, it's that inability to really engage in just how far we've gone past the point of redemption at this stage. And so there's a whole other kind of post-Anthropocene dialogue that really is lacking within design schools and pedagogy and curricula. So I'm going to stop it there, so allow us a chance to talk um, more generally, Delphina and I, about our shared and different ideas. But thank you for entertaining me for 10 minutes. Thanks a lot, Harriet, for this uh, revealing start. I completely agree with you with what you mentioned about how can design start designing for not making? Um, at DP, lately we're talking about design for subtraction, so design to reduce. Uh, I think this is a really important issue that design school should address um, for the future. During your provocation, you addressed several pressing concerns. So throughout this session, I would like to dig a little bit deeper uh, in some of your points. So firstly, I would like to ask you, which are your thoughts in terms of radical design pedagogy in relation to climate crisis and social injustice? So I'm interested to see which is your view regarding the change of paradigm that design needs. And also perhaps many of the listeners today are not very familiar with what you mean by radical pedagogy. So I think it would be great if you could briefly describe the situation. Sure. Um, so yeah, a few years ago, I read a book with Daisy Froud, um, who is amazing. Um, and it was looking really at the notion of what is a, a radical pedagogy in architecture, because obviously that's my um, discipline of origin. But I think the rules apply across all fields of spatial practice. Um, and we were trying to understand what it is that defined really um, a pedagogy for architecture and, and the specificity of a pedagogy for architecture within the UK, outside of looking at it as sort of um, global. And of course, one of the naiveties attached to that initial instinct was the fact that so much of world pedagogy is imperialist and western and that's another reason why decolonization is really the beginning of a process of a developing a climate crisis curriculum but radical interestingly as a term um, from the greek simply means um, root it means going back to a value system a, a series of ideas that are at the core of what we do and i suppose that one of the problems we have within um, a deregulated design world because you know there used to be so much more regulation um, that protected us all um, and that's being more and more corroded on you know in order to uh, fuel profit um, profit engineering um, for the elite and what we've what we've really started what we started to struggle with was this idea of actually there, there is no ethical framework there is no kind of consensus among designers about what is the way to conduct ourselves in, an, in a way that's responsible and consistent and so I suppose you know there's been a lot of conversations about the design of an ethical framework what is our toolkit in a way for responding to this problem is there any way that we could identify a way to move forward together where there are things that are just not acceptable so you know interestingly as i showed earlier in the slides there was one of an image of trump's walls and the sections of it and the many architects who queued up quite happily in the us to design see it as a design challenge um you know that was a shaming moment for all architects i imagine um and there's always somebody willing you know to, to step up and, and and you know design put in another kind of layer of gold on trump tower whatever so i think that there's always going to be this challenge around who where we stand in relation to the ethics of things and i think that we don't there is an interrogation that needs to happen around defining what a route is and it's discipline specific but it's also i think very much a transdisciplinary problem um, because it really comes down to what we want to do as designers what do we see our future as being where are we going to position ourselves into in, in relation to the ongoing crisis and some attempt at a solution Thank you, Harriet. And in regards to the figure of this radical pedagogue, can you tell us more of how you envision being critical, but in a propositional way in these times? And also perhaps if you have any good pedagogical examples that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think that, um, well, radical pedagogue, I mean, radical being root and pedagogue, as you probably know from the Latin, um, to teach children. We've had to lead children. And interestingly, you know, pedagogues in you know ancient rome and greece were actually um slaves um they were that were hired well not hired but literally slave teachers um and i think probably quite a few educators working under the current precarious conditions in higher education may feel that not much has changed but i think that what's interesting about this idea is that you know you talk about criticality and i think that really ties into what giraud talks about that often when, when we think of criticality it's about taking a marginal position in order to understand the problem so moving away from sort of being at the nucleus of the issue and actually 
um, being in a place where things are unstable because peripheries are unstable. You know, you're looking towards something and then you're turning your back to something, you're on unstable ground. And I think that one of the problems we've had is a, just a, unif a universal complacency as to our fundamental importance as designers, that we're necessarily good. You know, it's like if there was a degree in fossil fuels, I think people would be, oh yeah, that's, that's naturally going to be problematic, right? Um, you know, or I don't know, I mean, I'm assuming, but I, I mean, one would argue if it's called a degree in fossil fuels then automatically because fossils aren't fuels unless we burn them. Otherwise they're just fossils. Um, so I think that the issue is here, you know, you're, we've got this kind of like, we talk about the idea of being a radical pedagogue as being, okay, somebody who is, you know, able to lead, um, hopefully not in an indentured sense, but certainly to do so by bringing some sort of ethical framework into curriculum and pedagogy. Um, but it, it needs to be situated on a place of, I would say, um, instability, that it isn't just about churning out the same old canon and the same old characters and the same old cis white men, leaders of every dis um, design field, and seeing them as some sort of cornerstones or the, the masters, if you like, of, of any one field of practice. And I think our default to that is really what's threatening our ability to divorce ourselves from some of the obligations that we carry forward and the misapprehensions about what a designer or an architect or a fashion designer is based on this idea of needing to serve, you know, serve the masters or build upon established knowledge, which is what we get told all the time in our essay feedback. So I think that's a challenge, certainly, you know, not just for tutors who are teaching design studio, but for history theorists, um, history and theory tutors as well. I mean, also, as clearly it was shown in your presentation, as designers and design pedagogues, we have an enormous responsibility with not only the planet, but also with the society. So I wonder, considering these two aspects, how do you think the design curricula should evolve and which are the critical concerns that we should be addressing in our pedagogy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I suppose, I mean, I think with, I didn't really give you many good examples of in before when you did ask for some sort of suggestion about a pedagogic precedent. But I mean, just a simple thing in schools of architecture, we are right now having a, a bigger conversation at Pratt about how to decolonize the crit. Um, so last um, semester, we did a project, Michelle Gorman, Adam Elstein, um, and a bunch of other tu um, tutors, professors did um, a workshop looking at this decolonization of, of the design review with fine art students and also with Timothy Morton, um, who you know as an as astonishing philosopher scholar who's written various books, including high projects. And what we were trying to do is sort of look to the traditions of how to have a conversation about design that isn't the usual kind of binary where you've got, you know, the combative panel critiquing students and then you've got the students standing there as if they're being um, literally put on trial for coming up with their creative thought. Um, and then what you tend to ha have is this power dynamic, which is, you know, this kind of justification for the work, then a kind of attack upon the work. And then this, in many cases, designer or the, the, the critics not even having a shared perspective. And we see this as, you know, a really good way of having lots of different views on the work. But then there's a kind of like a tension between their push and pull on the work. So then none of the work, none of the feedback really aligns up. And there's, you know, and there's a lot of tension for the student and a lot of, often very i would say gendered racist and um you know and, and i would say classist dynamics at play in those conversations that privilege certain types of learners over others so i think that you know in this particular conversation that was had in our schools and experimentation students sat in a circle they used um, a talking stick so any person holding a stick could speak and it was very much geared around the idea of you know um, allowing people space to express things differently nobody is at the front nobody's at the back we're not again it's not that kind of judge and jury kind of um, spatial construct and much more around this kind of shared dialogue um, and, and you know just trying to ex explore what could this kind of like decolonized and deconstructed design crit look like and so I mean coming back to this question around you know being critical in design practice I think we've understood criticality previously to about to be about an assault on the integrity of the work so it's very much geared towards simply saying things that are you know um, reductive or negative or uh, looking for flaws and that's kind of like you know criticality 101 right it's how children in primary school understand criticism it's like you're loved or you're hated and you know really sort of polarized kind of dynamic that goes on and what we're trying to do is you know certainly start to understand criticality as something that isn't necessarily about this kind of relentless deconstruction negative deconstruction of, an, of somebody's intentions but much more around the idea of, of working towards some form of, of discourse that's more using critic criticality as a tool to just understand different forms of perspective, not as better or as, as right, but much more nuanced and much more around this idea of exploring, um, you know, the impact or the potential of a project beyond it's just, it's kind of like existence as an artifact and pushing it more towards an understanding of something that's actually 
um, in terms of, the, if you like, the its ability to generate more. So it's understood as a kind of, um, I don't know, a kind of the pin on the grenade that opens up the possibility of other ways of seeing things. So I think that when you know you talk about this idea of critical concerns, I think that for starters, the it's interesting to talk about this construct this conversation as curricula when really it's incredibly hard to divorce pedagogy from curriculum and vice versa the two are very interrelated and dependent so for that reason there needs to be not only a content critique and um, an understanding of what else is out there and restructuring our content um, with decolonization as a driving force but also understanding that pedagogy is much like knowledge have come again predisposed with a value system and that value system is principally um, imperialist and so we have to start looking at other ways of having conversations about work and about student performance that are really divorced of carrying forward in a tacit and often very explicit way um, a privileging system that's incredibly biased and discriminatory by default. I completely agree with you and I also I mean I see the challenge myself last year last academic year at DP we did a unit called Matters of Concern that was yeah, addressing sociopolitical issues around materials that designers use. And something I realize is the new generation of students, they're not very used to think critically. And think critically is not something that you can implement in a course. It's something that you really need to develop throughout a series of years. So I think it's really important that design and architecture start thinking of a way to introduce to critical thinking, not only theoretically, but as you mentioned before in your talk, in action. Uh, and I think the word critical a lot of time is being dumped out because it's linked to how you describe it to a uh, deconstructive uh, but I think we really need to start embedding it into construction of future linking it more into this uh, proactive new way of thinking uh, and I think it's not an easy one and, and you find yourself in some courses with very different students from very different parts of the world uh, that have very different traditions in this criticality applied. Uh, so I think that's definitely something to be revised uh, in curriculums of especially international uh, degrees uh, where people are standing yeah. in a very different uh, position into being critical, think critical and act uh, critical. Uh, I want to move now uh, to the topic of multi-species that you mentioned in your talk. Actually, I was looking at the Q&A recently and that was one of the first questions that Colette uh, mentioned here, she said, should human-centric design be put aside in favor of earth-centric thinking and design? Um, I know you're interested in Haraway's multi-species approach, so maybe also many of the audience is not familiar with uh, that approach, so if you could describe it, and also if yeah. you can tell us which are your thoughts in regards of how this multi-species could be applied into the design curricula? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for that question. I mean, I think that one of the problems we have, right, is that we, um, you know, um, we do still think it's like, um, okay, so it's for humans or it's against humans or it's for humans and it's, or it's not for humans, it's for the planet, but we're all members and participants of planetary existence. You know, we're not separate from nature. Um, again, to be honest, to paraphrase um, Morton's scholarship on this, we are, you know, it's, there's not sort of a partition between us. That's what's so interesting to me that, you know, we might operate like, you know, the most deadly species on the planet, but we still are another species and just another one. And in some ways, I think that the kind of narcissistic e egotism of our species needs a kind of 101 around this idea of actually, what if we aren't the most important species? What if there are more sophisticated ones? We just haven't figured out that they're actually running the show yet. So I think that when we talk about this idea of you know, you know, planet over people, I think, well, actually, it's about understanding it's a multi-species environmental solution that's needed. And this, you know, it, and it's also thinking beyond human, non-human, you know, in, to me anyway, in not just in terms of organic matter, so not just in terms of plants and animals, but it's understanding that we are at the moment churning out, goodness knows how many artificial, you know, like hu human, um, if you like, modelled or characterised um, forms of AI, and they have a place in all of this. There are at the moment 300,000 cyborgs on the planet, people who literally use technologies to adulterate their existence, who are almost becoming a kind of human subspecies um, and giving themselves advanced powers and advanced abilities by using these implants, whether it's, you know, increased sight or increased cognitive skills or, you know, five, 10 years from now, uh, you know, forget COVID, we'll all be at home just putting, plugging microchips into the back of our brain if we want to just learn French in, in 20 minutes. So these are some of the kind of dystopian futurist stories that are coming out of 
Wired Community's Endless um, Existential Anxiety publications, which is obviously wonderful and terrifying and not so far removed from 1960s science fiction writers like Philip K. Dick. So I think, you know, when we talk about this idea of actually it being a binary between any one species or any one system, I think we need to really try to understand what does multi-species. So when you get asked in your reviews, for example, and when tutors, and this is the complacency of tutors and professors, and, and of which I'm one, you know, the kind of metric is around its human impact and it's like understanding is how someone might reside in this place. There's never really a discussion about whether this building will actually kill loads of birds because they'll fly into it or um, the pollution will devastate a local pond that you've just put your wonderful structure next to or your clothing is made from material so toxic or or the flesh of other animals that is actually by implication generating if it's calf skin for example vast amounts of cruelty and suffering for tiny creatures but also vast amounts of toxic waste in the form of um, silage which you know is a massive damage has a massive impact on greenhouse gases and global um, temperature increases right now so these things are all deeply interconnected there's not a separation between you know um, what we um, this, this relational um, understanding of a solution and I think this is where we start bringing in words and this is where um, Haraway's scholarship is super important she you know invents these terminologies like poetic, um, simcrotic Chotchik, I'm never going to pronounce that word properly, and and she and then she also uses really fond phrases like um, non-human critters, which I'm also quite fond of. So this idea that you know um, there needs to be a playfulness and there needs to be an emphasis on storytelling and using that very much as a means to kind of um, recognise what the, the proposals are. So in, for example, ten years ago in design, we were, we thought it was pretty radical to say, oh, you know, let's start assessing the process that that students. Um, engage in when they're making their projects not just the end product and you know we thought that was avant-garde pedagogy a decade ago and it's like well it's i think it's investing into that in a much more much more rich way it's understanding that what are what is a story you know by region by gender by um, racial identity by sexuality there's ways that we need to start understanding what our engagement with all of these things the subjectivity of our interpretation of the natural world and our relation to it and as part of it so i think these this is where it starts to get really interesting um, but I think it is, again, coming back to this point, not making that separation and not asserting that separation so keenly if we really want to design things that um, have some sort of um, impact beyond the, the mere benefits to humans. I mean, I'd love to see design reviews where people start saying, and what about the bees? How does this affect bees? And have you thought about doing a multi-species dress, you know, or a pair of shoes or a phone? I mean, rather than it always being about the privileging of one particular type. So these are the opportunities. And I don't think people should, as I don't, see them as, as necessarily um, limitations on creativity. I see them as opportunities for greater creativity. Um, and that's where it starts to get super exciting. So, you know, it'd be interesting to see how that could evolve in terms of um, design outputs in the years ahead. Yeah, I completely agree. And if, I mean, if there's something that we can add to Donna Haraway's is species, it's uh, living matter. I think we should also care about the non-living matter, such as the abiotic component in, in biological terms. So the minerals, the vitamins, things that are still really relevant, still very important for ecosystem, but not living matter. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that way, I think, yeah, you really got the core of uh, the title of the Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble. I think yeah. we stay with the trouble. Yeah, and it's that trouble thing I think we need to entertain. It's like coming to terms with, we talk about care a lot in design at the moment. You know, we talk about designs that care and designs that are, and I just think, well, there's also, the other side of care is actually grief, because if you care about something, then actually you need to be prepared to lose it. And then what happens if you care about something and you lose it is it hurts like hell. So why are we not having a, a much more engaged conversation about grief? You know, I see pictures of polar bears wandering across Antarctica and they're all starving to death and it's terrible and painful and heart rendering. But I also think about all the invisible grief that we're causing, you know, children working in factories right now producing the raw materials needed for our products and, and systems. And, you know, that is that that's somehow not compelling it, or it's like we look at, you know, um, like birds falling out of the sky because they're overheating and all, all their habitats and um, on their migration um pathways have dried up so the lakes have gone and they've got housing estate there instead so they all keel over and die and that's happening everywhere i'm sure people know of this but again that you know the heart rendering images for me are also about the just you know what does that mean for us like you know every day that things we're surrendering five years ago you know when my architecture students many of them women would say i'm not sure if i want to be an architect and that's normally something that architecture student thinks at least once a year if not once a month and sometimes a week in some cases um, during their very long training um, and I used to, you know, for many of the female students, it used to be because they worried about the fact 
that it was sexist or discriminatory or incredibly hard to progress because it was sexist and discriminatory. And, you know, in the last couple of years, there's that conversation has shifted when, you know, not just female students, but, you know, people are saying, I'm not sure I want to become an architect. Um, you know, and it'd be like, oh, why is that? And it's, it's just doing that. Well, I don't think it's a relevant solution. And also, you know, I don't want to become a parent either. And it's very interesting sort of, I think there's a connection here that isn't really being made that, you know, we're designing what for, if we're not being parents, if we're not reproducing as a species, then it, what, we're designing for a kind of afterlife of, of non-humans. So it's super interesting to me that, you know, is the end game at this stage, if we were going to be super dystopian about it, to stop designing for humans immediately and start designing some form of reconstitutive infrastructure for species to outlive us, because maybe that's the way to do it, or even species to override us and take control of a situation that we've clearly failed to manage responsibly um, throughout several um, hundred years of human history and domination. No, I agree with you, but I also think in that case, design should really engage with ecology properly. They really need to spend time understanding these very complex systems that we live upon. It's not about a project in five months uh, mm -hmm. that disasters. So I think it's time of designers to really engage thoroughly with uh, ecosystemic uh, thinking, and that requires a lot of time. And and I think the curriculum is a little bit where you can start introducing uh, ecological principles uh, more than just like a project. So moving from the multi-species discussion, uh, I'm going to link this importance of the biodiversity into design and decolonization. What are your thoughts regarding how can we meaningfully decolonize design and which are potential strategies that we might apply in the field? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? So um, for me, for example, the recent Black Lives Matter movement is at the core of climate crisis curriculum because it's again that confrontation with a set of ideas, a set of values that privilege a certain form of operating, um, whether that's, you know, um, it's very much to do with the fact that what, what we're doing, what we're doing through this movement is really confronting power inequality. And this power inequality is really at the heart of what we're doing to the planet too. So I think that, um, you know, one of the things, and I just want to say hats off, by the way, if there are RTA students in this audience, just being completely impressed with a letter that was put together recently where many, many um, professors as well as students signed a letter with a statement of intention, a real and a really tangible, palpable commitment to understanding that change really needed to happen. And it was principally around pushing back on the power structures and becoming a school, becoming um, you know, a college in your case, that's very much geared around becoming um, some form of a, a prototype, really. How can you reconfigure the RCA so that it becomes a kind of um, you know, a template for how society can be reorganized or trade systems can be reorganized? How can you, you start with a school just like we tell our students, start with a model, right? So the school becomes the model for how we can reconfigure our society differently to confront these issues. And that's the opportunity. I think that's the missed opportunity in schools at the moment, because too often we're chasing the tale of QAA validation, disciplinary benchmarks, um, professional validation, and we're completely distracted from the fact that this is it. You know, this is the one chance you get, the one space you will have outside of the production line that is uh, mainstream education and professional life. To completely reimagine what a design practice is, to understand, to reimagine what a design industry is, to reimagine re what you know a policy governing an entire design production system around the world could look like, and by implication, the entire democratic structure needed to allow that policy to come into existence, which means confronting the, the if you like, the design of um, literally political systems, dem democratic systems, and I think that's the opportunity. We see ourselves as being, you know, I've got this thing and it's this big and it's beautiful, or this one dress, or this one app, or this one building, and it's like, my God, take that thinking and apply it to these meta-scale problems and see what happens. I think that's what the opportunity that's really missed, and I also think that, again, you know, when I came to the RCA as a student many, many years ago, because I'm super old, there was this kind of notion that the RCA was really interdisciplinary and it really wasn't, you know, I just want to say that was a completely mythological conceit. What was interdisciplinary about it is that we spent a lot of time hanging out in the bar and playing pool and hanging out in the student common room and on the terrace, just sharing ideas and talking to each other and just being engaged in what everyone else was doing. But it wasn't really the kind of framework for people to meaningfully collaborate. And I think that we've got to start thinking more and more as schools, and this is my own included, about how do we foster these opportunities, platforms for exchange, but crucially, and this will be my final point on this issue because I know we want to jump into audience questions. You know, if we are serious about this idea of, of power and confronting power, then we need to start giving students more agency. And that means, 
you know, to use a fancy term, it means an emphasis on autodidacticism. In other words, let students set some curriculum, let them take leadership roles within the institution. Why is there not, you know, a, an assistant provost of students who's a student? You know, we have a union, but that's something different. So, you know, I think that there's opportunities to actually restructure or, um, how entire institutions are being run. So it's a far more democratic and inclusive conversation. And similarly, students come in with a wealth of experience and ideas and creativity and, and lived experience and also, you know, how they identify being different from other students. And that's part of the conversation. That's part of the knowledge um, creation and the knowledge framing and the knowledge, um, you know, appreciation. So again, we need to find new systems for really involving students in, in setting their own agendas for school and in setting that you know what should how should their work be judged why should it be judged by you know a couple of white male tutors are in their 50s lovely as they are telling telling them what successful portfolio should look like why can't they be co-authors in the pursuit of a certain set of um outcomes that they value and they think are relevant to the countries that they are from and and we um, and the context and the identities that they're from you know that's that's the opportunity and we're missing it so I could bang on for hours about it, but I don't want to do that because we've got 10 minutes. <laughs> so we really should open it up for some questions at this point. <laughs> Sorry, getting a bit enthusiastic. Thank you, Harriet, for your insightful uh, wake up call. We will, move, we will now move into some questions. Uh, there is a question in relation to changing curriculum and pedagogies radically. The question is, how much do you think academic institutions themselves need to change does the current system just reinforce the existing hegemonies and disaster capitalism? Okay, I might have do you want, I might have missed that last bit. There was a little bit of a drop in transmission, so I'm just trying to look through, scroll through the questions. Do you want to say that again? Sorry. So I'll repeat it again. How much do you think the academic institutions themselves need to change, and does the current system just reinforce the existing hegemonies and disaster capitalism? Yeah, I think the answer is a lot and yes, <laughs> basically. So, um, I mean, you know, this is the thing, right? We, we just, a moment ago, was waxing lyrical about redesigning government, redesigning democracy, and, and you know, and again, this idea of redesigning school. And, and actually, that's a, exactly the point, right? So how do we, how could we reimagine what the power structure of a school looks like so that it's completely different? Um, you know, uh, since I joined Pratt, we have students who've got their own budget, their own, run their own lecture series. Um, we've just put together a proposal so there'll be student deans in every single one of the schools, six schools at Pratt, who are part of governance. Students come to faculty meetings now, they didn't before, and there was it was a kind of students and student council and faculty meeting, very, very siloed. Um, and, you know, we have meetings with the students on a routine basis to get their ideas about things um, and, and, and also support their scholarship and just not, not just their engagement in the political leadership side of schools. So I think, you know, that that's the beginning, but no way is it, the, you know, that's the tip of the iceberg. I know that there is so much more that can be done. Um, and the only way I'm going to figure that out as a dean is truthfully, is if I make sure that students have a place at the table. I can't speculate on this stuff. But at the same time, I need to make sure that faculty are there and it's not something that it becomes a dean project. Um, it needs to be done in an incredibly inclusive and um, equitable way. Otherwise, it's not going to stick. People you end up with a very polarised school or department and there needs to be this sense of equitable engagement. Otherwise, you'll just end up with, a, a, and again, another binary, a, you know, a kind of fragmentation of, of the collective within a school and little will be achieved. Thank you. There is a question from Fernando. How you define how you assess that the construction model or is assess this less <laughs> how would i just decide if the construction model i didn't quite catch that last bit or it's not possible to assess at the construction model i think the question is quite conceptual how to assess at the construction model how to assess a deconstruction model yeah i mean i'm not sure what that means necessarily but let me have a think about it for a second because if it's there's something quite nice about an ambiguous question because it gives me agency to offer an ambiguous answer so when i think about um deconstruction you know and i think about it as sometimes a necessary process in order to really get to the heart of understanding a problem a bit like when i was a kid right and i just like deconstruct my bicycle and, and then in order to understand how to put it together and so i think that deconstruction plays an important role in understanding what all, all the contingencies and the relationships between any one system um but then you know i think that um you know one of the challenges i think with assessing of course if we're saying to students right your projects to deconstruct rather than to, to construct and i think that's super interesting and just to zoom out for a second think about architecture 
you know, architecture as a as a discipline at the moment, and certainly as a sector, we think within the next um, 40 years, something like 80 percent of um, buildings will be repurposed. They won't be new build. And at the moment, you can shave about 18 to 20 percent off a build budget if you use recycled materials. I mean, look at the work of Rotor in Belgium, astonishing designers and my next book with Rory Hyde and Roberta Maracaccio which is Architects After Architecture looks at the 66% of architecture students who go off and do other things with an architecture degree that's nothing to do with architecture many of whom really interestingly have gone out and not just done any old thing but gone out with this massive like I would say um, ethical um, kind of like a uh, allergic reaction to architecture so there's something problematic in the way that most architecture, mainstream architecture is incredibly conservative and incredibly complicit in the problem, the point I made earlier, that ends up, you know, pushing people towards when they do migrate out of architecture and do things that are either, you know, edge condition or other to architecture. It's often very ethics driven, very kind of environmentally or socially conscious. So I find that super interesting as well, that, you know, when we start to take things apart, that there's that push towards through the process of deconstruction, understanding that, you know, there's still something there. The substance is not the the, the kind of piles of, you know, deconstructed building, i.e. bags of rubble or stacks of recyclable floor tiles. It's something about the blueprint of the process that you've created through enacting a deconstruction on a space or an artifact or an object. And that's, that's, the, that's the thing that should be measured and that's the thing that should be valued. Thank you, Harriet. And maybe because it was the last question, I really like one time that you made this analogy between what happened with a brutalist building and the difference when you think buildings as compost. So I think that really, that exemplifies very well what you're trying to explain now. And I think it's a, it's a very nice, for me, it really opens my mind in relation to sustainability and architecture in a very different way of just putting some green around and some dubious uh, internal changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely want to give credit where it's due um, to Jeremy Till's scholarship in architecture depends. He talks about there's a great chapter which is entitled um, "All Buildings or um, All Architecture is, is Waste in Transit," which I think is completely true, right? And I think that's one of the things we struggle with that we, you know, we look to the the classic classical order, and often in any one discipline, and we have our icons, whether it's a building or a product. Um, and that, of course, there's, you know, we have an automatic assumption that it's the things that are endured that are, are somehow more significant than things that have intentionally been designed to corrode or, or you know, um, compost or whatever. And I think that's one of the challenges that we don't design, understanding that it wouldn't, you know, that we really should design so that very quickly after something has come into productive use, that it's that the design of its um, deconstruction and its um, composting or whatever is actually a big part of that assessment. One of the things I find interesting is that, you know, we I used to give a lecture when I started out as an architectural academic many, many years ago, um, you know, which I think I had to give it to first years and I was asked by the head of the undergraduate program to, you know, give a lecture on architecture as a business. So I merrily went along and said, by the way, everybody, or at least one in four architects will get sued during their career for some form of negligence or incompetence. And uh, afterwards, I won't say who she is, but she came and told me off saying, you just scared loads of students. And they don't want to be architects now. And I thought, well, isn't it important that you tell them this right at the beginning? But, um, you know, it, it kind of occurred to me the other day that, you know, we're seeing more and more class actions because of people's exposure to chemicals. You know, there's, um, there's some sort of like garden pesticide in the US that recently, about last week, in fact, massive class action for millions and millions of dollars to basically um, compensate the many, many thousands of people who've got, who've got cancer as a direct result of using this pesticide. So I think that what, you know, we, we understand our liabilities as being about, does it not break when it's used? Does it last at least two years? I mean, I think Apple, and this is a really critical view, I'm quite happy to hold it and Apple can get on the phone and correct me if I'm wrong. But I think, you know, to me, it seems they quite deliberately design things to become obsolete within a certain period of time. And they do that cynically so they can replace these products. So it's not just that they're fragile and they break, but it's about all the time upgrading the plugs or whatever it is. And there's that intentional, you know, finitude, which is actually profits driven. It's not environmentally driven. It's, you know, ear pods don't break down. So these things I'm wearing, you know, they reckon at least a couple of thousand years and even then because it's hard plastic. So, you know, it's like we are sort of the most significant design houses. You have more resources than any other. Um, a small boutique in Hackney right now to come up with solutions uh, irresponsibly and uneth unethically still not committed to this idea of making sure that the afterlife of their products is one wh which allows these products to die biodegrade responsibly and it's a terrible tragedy um, and again it comes back to this idea of designing the political infrastructure and the legislation needed to impose upon these corporations the obligation to do that. I think it's really relevant and I think yeah, more and more designers should think about the afterlife in how it's decomposable, how it's recycled. But I really think that the way 
to go is also how design can influence in this way also policy making because I think until you don't touch that point it doesn't get so massively distributed but at least uh, Europe is uh, at least with the right to reuse and to repair so the right to repair I think is a really good step in terms of how we think a little bit about yeah products uh, but in America I, I don't think that's the, the case or I don't think it's in the table legally yet is it no no and it's interesting isn't it because you know we often think of solutions as being you know contingent on some you know the latest technologies or some sophisticated solution um, that's somewhere in the future and we're just around the corner from realizing it and just coming back to the point you made about repair you know if you look back on the traditions of Japanese culture for example when something breaks like a plate it was fixed using gold so there was this kind of appreciation of something having this fragility and the, and the damage actually being something that increased the value of the object rather than decreased it you know but we've been we are preconditioned through modern capitalism to think that if something is scuffed or damaged and it should be replaced you know all that time that drive to be presentable even as you know in the way that we look in our mind all the things that we surround ourselves with and I think that again is something that really needs to be challenged because it's a, it's entirely about this endless production this you know infinite production which is you know the the whole challenge here this growth obsession this expansion obsession this needs driven obsession with the endless and relentless accumulation of objects and artifacts and spaces and, and unless we have we reach out to inaction we're, we're really not going to be able to do anything about the current crisis and that really is the, the, the if you like the curriculum challenge to all educators um, and to do it using the decolonization framework I'm aware that it's 101, just thought I'd say that in case you had to have a say, uh, say some sort of wrapping up thing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Harriet, for being with us tonight here in Europe. I guess it's still lunch or morning in the US. Well, I encourage all of the audience to think and incorporate in the practice some of uh, Harriet's concepts of uh, this uh, provocation. I'm sure it will be very challenging, but very undoubtedly uh, it will bring a meaningful accomplishment, that's for sure. So I leave the screen now to Joe to wrap it up. Uh, lovely. Thank you, Delfina. Thank you. Harriet uh, for sharing your thoughts and expertise um, and also thank you to everybody um, that uh, joined us uh, in today's uh, talk. If you have any additional questions or would like to connect directly with the executive education team and or the speakers, please use the contact information as seen on this slide. Please follow us on social media at RCA Short Courses on Twitter and Instagram and make sure to check our event webpage for upcoming in session talks and how to register for free. And again, all the information on the slide. Thank you for your time and goodbye everybody. <laughs>